created the model, you know what it's doing. And then just to see what the indicator says the data is doing, so that you have a check to so that you know that that proxy is really representing what you think. So to do that, you need to make a little bit of a toy world. So that's what models are. They're a toy version of the world. So this is my children's interpretation of a coral reef. And that's the way that you need to think about a model, that it's just a little cartoon of the way the world works. So the first thing you need to do when you're creating a model is to pick the spot that you're going to do it. So the same process that you went through yesterday in picking a location and a topic to address with your indicators, you need to do that when you're doing a model. The extra step you need to do when you're going to create a model to test an indicator is you need to think about the data that the indicator needs. So there's no point creating a model that doesn't generate data that's useful. So I don't know how many of you have heard of the Turing test, which is to see if a computer is a person. You hide the computer on the other side of a screen, and if it can give you answers that you can't distinguish from a person, then it's passed the test. Well, you want a data Turing test. Turing test. You want a model that generates realistic enough data that it's a good test for that indicator. So when you're creating a model for the marine system, there's quite a long checklist that you can go through about what kind of physical environment there is, what kind of biological processes, what animals that you put into it, uh, all of those kind of things. This is a very biologically focused, oceanographic focused one. This one entry at the end about all the human bits, that can be just as long, if not longer. So when you come, you don't have to have enormous detail in all of these parts, but you do need to have thought through what are the influences that you're going to have to capture in your data to make sure it's realistic. Now, I have three teenagers, two of which I'm trying to teach to drive, so I'm going grey very quickly. One of them is trying to convince, that, convince me he really needs a motorcycle. I think he thinks it's going to finally get him a girlfriend. The issue is that he wants to start not only at this end, he wants to come off this end and have a Harley Davidson, where being the mother who's a bit of a cheapskate, I'm saying, but you've already got a bicycle. Surely that's enough for getting around where we live. So trying to get across to him that it's not just the available resources that he has. He doesn't have a job, so I have to pay for everything. So it's the available resources that he has. It's his ability to control it sensibly, so I don't think he should ever be allowed at the present moment on a motorcycle at that end of the room. So it's what you can do with it, how you can control it, what information you've got or the resources you've got to hand to build that model in the first place. But the one thing to remember is regardless of the competitive nature of humans and regardless of the fights you'll see in the literature about this is the best model, we're not here for a sales pitch. Models are good. All models are useful tools when used correctly. And having more, the better, because you can see the different ways that they capture different things. So there's no one best model. You just pick what you need for that particular time. There's lots of different model types. So some of the most effective advances have actually come from really simple models. These can be just on pieces of paper to help you think through a problem. Sometimes. Once you've really sat down and thought about it, you'll see that indicator's ever, never actually going to work or that process that you think about isn't actually working the way that you thought it did because you'd forgotten some bit. But taking the time to draw the connections and think about what that system looks like can be enough of a mental experiment that you come to understand. From there on out, you can start to build more mathematical models that bring in more and different parts of the system. Lots of models focus on one little bit in lots of detail, and that might be enough if all of the indicators you're looking about are in that one little bit. So if you're looking at population numbers or size in a fishery where... So let's imagine we've got an abalone fishery where you dive down and you pick up the abalone off the bottom. You don't have any bycatch. There's not a lot of other interactions going on. The fisherman on the boat is kind of the only direct connection. So having a very simple model that's just the abalone population and the fishermen, in that sense, might be enough. Rashid will now go jump in and say, no, you need the global market economy as well. But you actually can break down some of these to quite targeted questions. As you get into multi-species questions or questions where there's a social influence on behaviour, all of those kind of things, then you start to get into the sort of hairier space where you need more and more of the system just because the data has to reflect and you're the modelling processes have to reflect a lot of those interactions. Okay, so there's also the question of um, what kind of scale to build it at. So 
I was working on a part of Western Australia and they were all the different scales that were important to that particular beach on Western Australia. So that's the tricky part of living in the marine world. If you're looking at even just a small part of it, there's about 14 orders of magnitude to the processes that are involved in that part of the marine ecosystem. From the very fine bacterial scale where the nutrient cycling happens to the basin scale where you've got the big long-term environmental effects. So when I do a, what's called a whole of ecosystem model where I try to capture the, the physical world, the food web and then the people that use it, I have to span this range of processes. Now that might sound ridiculous and daunting and uh, but actually if you're a manager, so if you're a man trying to manage or a woman trying to manage a beach in Western Australia, you're already dealing with three or four orders of magnitude and things that you have to, to deal with. You may not consciously know that, but the little mental model you have in your head has to deal with that. So in making a quantitative model to test the indicators to see if we can help that manager, we need to make sure that we span the processes that are influencing the decisions they have to make. Now we hear a lot, every scientist does this, my part is the most important part, it's really complicated and you just don't understand it unless you delve into it. That's fair enough, everything gets big in detail, so you see quite complicated uh, global climate models that Eric will talk about and plankton models where they talk about how complicated it is, how complex it is. When you get into the world of looking at indicators for the stuff that IMBA wants to look at, where you're looking at social and ecological and economic together, it's not so much about fine prediction, it's about getting the general what if well. What if the world works like this? So the level of uncertainty you're going from is from an ice cube to an iceberg. Okay, so we hear lots of people arguing about tiny details, which in reality sit in this. And when you start to address the questions that Imbra has at its heart, you're starting to move up to this. But this is more like living in a science fiction world. That's not to say it's not based on reality, but you're pulling science together to create a story about how the world works. And that's why you can use it as a test bed for these ideas, a test bed for the indicators and the management. And that's because it's interfacing all the different parts of the system. So they're all interconnected, they all drive each other in different ways. So even if you don't include all of these explicit parts in the model that you're thinking about, you have to think about their influence as you build the model in the first place. A key part of it is to represent the uncertainty or the errors that can crop up. So lots of people, when they build a model, think about stochastic processes that might happen in the biology, whether, the ran whether it was a big recruitment or a little recruitment of fish. Sometimes they recognise that there's some random events that might happen or seemingly random events in things like stock markets that can drive jostling of prices. They don't recognise the errors that can creep in as you do assessments or you make your management decisions. Most of the uncertainty... So if we think of fisheries, so there's lots of fisheries in the world that have collapsed, for instance, that have like the cod and things like that. It's usually the guy here, the scientist who's doing the assessment that gets all the blame. They say, you got your model wrong. What they've neglected to check was the error at every step. So most fisheries in the world have collapsed because of humans didn't do what was expected by the managers. So the really important part that we'll talk about probably tomorrow, but one of the areas you have to think about is the errors that are coming from signals that go back up through the humans. So again, you don't always have to put all of these in your model, but you have to have thought about them and the influence they have on your indicators. And when you're using your indicators in real life and calculating them off real data, you still need to think about those problems. That's something Alida talked about yesterday. What's driving that difference in the ratio? Which part of the ratio is going up and down? When you've got a catch index, why has it changed? Is it the, the stock that has changed or is it the human use that has changed? So the mental model that you use when you're doing the indicator, you should go through the same process as if you were making a quantitative model so that you can understand the confounding problems that might come along with the indicator. The useful part about testing it in a model is that you can slip in and out different ways that those parts of the world might work so that you can really give it a test to see how robust it is to different sources of, or sources of uncertainty. But then at the other end, you can see when it works and when it doesn't. Okay, so over the course of the last 
Well, all the times that humans have been trying to build models, which is mathematically many hundreds of years now, but particularly in the last 40 years, we've come to terms with how to model all the different parts of the natural world, right down to biodiversity and evolution. So we can now have a simple... Some of them are pretty gross, some of them are pretty crude, but we can actually model all the different parts of the way the ecological world works now and the oceanography. On the human side of things, there's been a lot of advances too. It's not always in the same language and thought about in the same way. But you can actually model all the different parts of the way that humans work. So despite the fact you can hear lots of people say that you can't model humans, we're far too complex. We have our base motivations. If modelling humans didn't work, advertising wouldn't work. Okay, so you can predict what a human's going to do. The part that we don't have a great grasp on yet is mainly because we don't have the data, is how governance and institutions change through time. So we're starting to work on that. We're starting to get a little bit of an idea, but it's probably the last big chunk where there's no good first step. So if you think about the different kinds of models, some of these are like tottering little babies taking their first steps on being able to work, but we are having that first go at everything. So when you're trying to build a model, whether it's a tiny little one for one little part or if it's the whole system, you have to think about what details to put in there. In particular, you have to think about where the sources of delay are. So delay, so when there's a pause between an effect, when you do something and having an effect, that's when you get your biggest complexity come in. So that's where your non-linearity comes in. Humans are very, very good at linear mental models. Um, we can subconsciously do some complex models, that's why we can catch a ball, but most of the time we, ha we expect, if it's cold, we put up the temperature of the heater so that we get warm. We're very good at linear models. Complex models, dealing with a complex situation where there's feedback, you might as well toss a coin for most people as to how well they'll guess what's going to happen. Okay, with training though, they can get much better. So it's like any skill, if you train someone to think about a complex system, then they get much, much better. They're never perfect, they're far too complicated for that, but they're much, much better. And that's another role that models can have. It can be a training exercise to help people understand when they get the information from an indicator, how to use that to make the best possible decision given all the uncertainties around. One of the key parts of that, though, is this feedback part. So what you see when models are usually first, and it's always good to take a first step, is that model or one part of the system will just be said to influence the other. As we get a greater appreciation, we realise we really need to include these feedbacks because this is where the bits that will trip up the indicator and trip up management come in. OK, so since I started my career a couple of decades ago now, there's been quite a diversity of modelling types arrive, whether they focus on some particular bits or they try to take a crack at the whole system. This last one here is kind of where the future of modelling appears to sit, where you don't try and shoehorn all the different model type mo parts of the system into one model type. You say, OK, for habitat, this is the best way of doing habitats. This is the best way of doing the ocean. This is the best way of doing people. And you tie them together. Because it's not the same scales and it's not the same process as driving every part of the model. So why do we think we could build it? You don't have a car that's only built from nails or bolts, I don't build cars, so there's probably no nails in a car anyway. Um, but you use different parts for the different part of the car, so you need that same kind of idea when you're building a model. One of the ways to do that, um, that's increasingly, so when I started, there was kind of just me for what I wanted to do, so I had to learn how to tie the different parts together. These days, thanks to things like IMBA, there's a much broader community who wants to ask these questions. So that's where you can get the experts from the different parts of the system, so you could have Rashid, talk to Eric, talk to Alida. You know, you could get the different experts to build their parts. And then you use the computer scientists in the middle to tie them together. So you still have the feedbacks, but you get the benefit from working in teams. So that's another reason for you guys to come together to see if there's people that you can work with to bounce off. So that's what we've been trying to encourage in the groups of the afternoon, that you guys bring your expert information together to bounce off each other to see if you get a bigger understanding. When you're building models, though, it's like using a map. There's a place where they're useful and then they start to tail off. Models are there and indicators are there to give you information about what's going on. 
So at this extreme down here, so this is model complexity effectively across the bottom here, this is how well it works up the side. Down in this corner, things don't work very well. So that's like being presented a very blank map. So just say we have to go to a restaurant tonight, look at the map, if it's just a blank sheet of paper, that's completely no help whatsoever. If, on the other hand, we go out all the other way and we were handed a hologram that had every person and every dog and every cat and every car moving around, it's just the real world and it's just as complicated. You're not having any help whatsoever. What you're after is the street map in the middle that's got just the key landmarks and the pathways so it's got maximum information content for your brain to be able to figure out what's going on. So what we've found in filling out this space of different models through time is, yes, it looks like that intermediate complexity in the different scales and processes is the place for the most effective models, with the caveat that a bad modeler can screw up any model. <laughs> so sometimes models don't work just because the person doesn't have enough experience or they're having a bad hair day or something. So you need to remember that to, to check why things aren't working. That's equally true when you get to an indicator or a model. Sometimes the problem's with the data. It's not always with the model. You should always assume that it's the model first and go through and double check everything. But sometimes you do have to take the, the great courage to return to the data person and say, I think you might have made a little bit of a mistake here. They don't usually like hearing that, but you do have to sometimes have that conversation. Okay, so the FAO has documents on how to build models. So pretty much they sort of reflect what I've already said here. That could be partly because I helped write them. Um, but part of the part, the part of the part, one of the key things as you step into how to build these things is to think of the space-time continuum. I'm a bit of a science fiction fan, so that immediately sends me off to Doctor Who, but... What you're really trying to think about is where the core part of the system is. What's the bit you've got to get really well because the indicator or the animal's always there? Then you think about a bit like an onion. What are the layers around that that are influencing that core part? Now, do you need to have them in or can at some point you say, actually, that's a little bit beyond what I need to think about. So you don't have to have the whole onion. You can take some of the outer layers off. And it comes down to, say, if we're building a model of a marine ecosystem... What's the bottom of the ocean doing? What's the currents doing? Where are the animals? Where are the humans? One of the key problems that we find when we're trying to build these models with a new group, so I had an experience, for instance, in America, where we came and I said, well, you need, because of the current system, you need to extend up the coast into Canada. And they go, no, no, we have to stop at the border. I was like, did anyone tell the fish they have to stop at the border? That you need to think about the biological and the human parts of the system. The other thing that I keep saying is you don't always have to have all of the processes in there. So some processes you leave out because they're at scales you don't want to think that are too big. But in going up the other way, there's scales that are too fine for you to want to think about. You don't want to have to model every atom in every animal, even though obviously animals are made up of atoms in the physiological processes. So you can use mathematical tricks to cover what's called a subgrid scale process. So what that means is you can use maths to represent the influence of that process when you're coming up from underneath without having to actually finally resolve that process. So indicators and models both alike, it's about how to proxy a process without having to directly model every different step of it or collect data on every different step of it. So there's different ways of thinking of space, and I'll actually step through an example of what this might look like for an ecosystem in a minute. But when you're putting together data, uh, or you're putting together a model, the easiest way of thinking about space is in a grid. Humans like grids. It's easy to imagine. It's easy to see. Unfortunately, it's not the way the world works. So there's nothing wrong with building a model like that, but you'll find it hard to put data in every single spot. You'll have to guess, because you won't have data. Most of the time... The way that data is collected is they go to the hotspots of action. So there's some quite regular survey grids in places like the Bering Sea in Alaska, but in lots of other places it's like, well, we're not going to monitor the whole empty ocean because we know that the seals only come to this island. So ecology and oceanography and even the data collection is very lumpy. So there's a different way of looking at space is actually to use polygons to put the attention and the fine detail around where there's lots of that action. And then just to use bigger places, 
where the action is less, because you can use fairly simple statistical properties to say what's happening with eddies or temperature out here and concentrate your fine detail where the action is really happening. Uh, another way to do that is actually to nest different scales. And the, re the reason you might want to do this, this is what's called an error map. This is, um, they're trying to estimate the sea surface temperature in a global climate model. And red is bad. That means they've got it way too high. In fact, they're six degrees too hot. Okay? So you can see off the major upwellings and areas like that, they were just wrong. Okay? There's no easy way of saying it. And they're quite upfront about that. So how are they going to fix that? Because the, the model was obviously working okay out in the open ocean. It was, you know, fairly close to what it needed to be. So there's a couple of different ways you can tackle that question. One is to go back to that polygon idea and just put a lot more attention into the upwelling zones, which is what they started to do. So that's a very common approach now in physical modelling, and Eric might have more to say on that. Another way to do it is actually to take a finer scale and embed it in that bigger model. Now, once you do something like that, to grab the influence of the fine scale processes, you can see that it effectively fixed a lot of their problem. So you don't have to use the same resolution at all scales, at all parts of the model. Another thing, another reason to do that is that it means that you can resolve different processes in different places. So this is a potential heat map for the waters around Australia in 2060 to 2065. When you have a big grid, the sort of the first grid that they have, you can see this nice smooth flow of water down here. And this model, this one in particular, tends to predict that we'll have an increase in primary productivity here, but a decrease over here. And so a whole bunch of management responses started down that track saying, what are we going to do to protect and help fish over here and we'll get our extra production over here? And then the physical oceanographers used the nesting trick and the downscaling trick to allow for eddies to be in the system. And that allowed for biological pumping where the animal production and eddies drove nutrient mixing. This model says we'll have a decline in production over here and our increase in production will be over here. <laughs> So that's why it can be important to think about those fine scale processes, even if you have to use larger ones for the background context. The same happens on the temporal side of things. So most of us think of time as just evenly stepping through one step at a time, okay? Um, that's quite common in most models. It's the most common way of building the time backbone of a model. You can get into a little bit of fun when you have bacteria to whales in the same model, because a whale thinks a day is a very small part of its life, whereas a bacterial population can turn over a few times in a day. So the way of marrying those is to have your very fast living animals have tiny little time steps that add up to a day or a week or whatever, and have that the next big time step for the slow living animals, so that each animal's kind of experiencing time as a proportion of their life. So they have the big slow steps for the slow responding animals and the fast time steps for the fast animals. It works better mathematically to do it that way. You get less problems with the maths. But it also means that your computers run faster. You don't have to sit there for 12 weeks waiting for everybody to work at a bacterial scale. There is another way of thinking about time, though. So I don't know about you, but I don't watch the clock while I'm asleep. So they're for a large chunk of the day, I effectively have one time step. But if I'm trying to j jump out of the way of a crazy driver, there's a lot of little time steps that I need to get through fast. <laughs> okay? So that's the same process. Fish asleep, fish awake eating, fish running away from predator. <laughs> you can use that same kind of stepped. It's pretty much the same logic as your computer uses to run. It's not spending the same amount of time on every program that you've got open. So you can use that same computational process that they use in operating systems to run time in models. It's a lot trickier, it's a lot harder to get your head around, but it can again be a, a way of getting lots of different processes that you need into this one model if they're critical. If you're looking at a... I look at a thousand different indicators when I'm testing them in my models. Get all of those different indicators in the one model, I have to use tricks like this to bend space and time so I can fit it all together. You do need a regular heartbeat underneath, though, because you don't want your animals to get too much out of sync, but that's a, a different thing to worry about. 
Okay, so if we start to step together what this might look like, so building up from the physical world that Eric will talk about, models pretty much in that sort of global space started off with temperature and oxygen and those kind of things. And then they thought, oh, well, we might need to add just a little bit of ecology. So we've kind of got to the stage where we now have plankton models in most, most Earth system models so that they can look at carbon and nitrogen and those kind of cycles. That's meant that they've realised they've had to get to finer scales to get the physics right to help the biology look right. So again, they're using a feedback between models and indicators and data to understand how they need to put things together. People, particularly in France, but all over the world now, are starting to build models that go from the physics to the plankton to the fish. So these are some age-resolved models for the, the Pacific. Some of these are now global. And you can... The bigger these models get, the more indicators that they can test in parallel. So you've got a temperature signal, you've got a fish size signal, you've got um, fish numbers. So you can see where the connections are. You can start to try to tease out the relationships between different indicators. But it can be important what you put in the biology side of things. Just as important it is for space and time, it's important how you represent the biological part of the web. So it's all about... Um, when I get presented a paper to review, the ones I really love in that gives me a good laugh is when they've got five different kinds of whale, ten different kinds of seabird, lots of different fish, and then it's all other benthic invertebrates, which is kind of the creature you've got up the top there. Okay, so you need to actually think about what artefacts you introduce when you do that. What are you missing? What feedbacks are you forgetting? And in pelagic systems, it might not be important. But for benthic systems in particular, it is important what you do with the invertebrates. So when you're putting one of these together, you need to think about how do they use the ecosystem? Who do they eat? Who eats them? How do they use the habitat? What temperatures do they like? How do they interact with each other? Are they fast-living animals? Are they slow-living animals? So that functional diversity, how they function in an ecosystem, is a much better way of representing the ecosystem than what particular name they have and what species that means they're related to. So a trick that it was actually invented in biology, then grew up in the social science, and has now come back to biology, is a clustering method called regular coloration. So you can go through a food web and colour the animals in the dots. So each one of these represents an animal or a plant, and you colour it based on the pattern. So this is our basal primary producer, and there's three things that eat it, but there's kind of two lines. So these things can be grouped because they both eat that, and they're eaten by these guys who can be grouped because they both eat these and they're eaten by those. So you can see that there's coloured chains that you can create. That coloured chain there, so the green, blue, pink and brown one, you can make those your functional groups in a model. You can't lump these up because they're in a different chain. So you have to use the colours to give you a guide of how to build the chains. And the tests we've done, if you give it to an ecologist who's just using their ecological data and their, their knowledge to by experience lump things and then use this regular coloration technique, they come out with the same answer, which was terrific for us because it meant that finally we could say to reviewers, but there's a statistical package that backs up what we've just said. So it's a way of capturing those interactions. And it works on people and the way that they work and how they lump out personality-wise, response-wise, livelihood-wise... So it's a common way that you can then extend through the system as well. It also teaches you that you can't lump predators and prey. So that's a bit hard in cannibalism and ontogeny and stuff, but if you've got a really clear prey species and a really clear predator species, you get the wrong answer out of your model if you lump them. So sometimes it's just better to leave things out than to overly lump. The other thing you've got to realise is that... Um, you're going to have to be pragmatic about when you leave things out, but you need to always realise, both in indicators and models, that there's unexpected things. So if, I don't know if you've ever watched horror movies, but it's usually the thing hiding in the basement that comes flying out to kill you, right, just at the important time. As a modeler, that's what you face all the time. The things that you forgot about or said weren't important, let's ignore them, inevitably almost always come back and be important somewhere down the track. The same problem with indicators. A situation or a environmental condition that wasn't important when they were first developed can come out down the track. So the kinds of problems with the ageing models that Eric talked about and your proxies, you always have to keep them in mind about what could be undermining your model and your indicator. 
As you step up through the system, you can start to look at more and more indicators. This is a model from the, the Bering Sea, the, the northern part of the North Pacific. They wanted not only to represent the dynamics of a large part of the ecosystem and the physical world it was embedded in, they wanted to test indicators for the different bits. So because they wanted so many, they have 200, Alida might know this better than me, but I think there's 240 indicators in their real world ecological indicator report that they put up with their stock assessments every year. And they wanted to explore at least some of those indicators to see if they were robust or not. So they needed quite a complicated model so they had the right connections between things to do those tests. The other part of it though is you have to think a little bit outside the box sometimes. So a lot of our theory in the marine world is built around the pelagic vision of the world where big fish eat little fish which eat littler fish. And a lot of the early data from the North Atlantic really held that up. And it's a very simple macroecological relationship then. That means you have a really simple model that runs in about 30 seconds that can do quite large parts of the Earth very quickly and you can test size-based indicators for it. Problem is that the benthic world doesn't work anything like that. So we have, if we have a nice flat line of connections and interactions in the pelagic world, a Sheldon spectra it's called, about the amount of biomass per size, in the benthic world, it's a W, because it's about the way the animals experience the world. So at the really big animal end of the world, they see the world as 2D, because much like us, they live on the bottom. They just walk around on things. When you get into this middle bit here, they experience the world in 3D. They can move through the sediments. They live a bit like a fish up in the water column, in that they see the world, they go up and down as well as left and right. When you get back down to the tiny end of the world, it's back to 2D. Your bacteria and other things living on the surface of sediment particles. So the different way that they experience space changes the way that that ecosystem part works. So you have to actually represent this in a different way to represent that. So when there's connections between them, you have to think a little bit outside the box. So again, it's not about treating all parts of the ecosystem in the same way. Equally, all of the kind of lessons I just gave you for the, the biology side actually apply really well to the human side. So you can use the same thinking process when going through the human parts of the system. Most people who do biological and physical models start with this, which is just to say, well, I think the humans might do this. What happens if they do that? They paint a picture of more fishing pressure or less fishing pressure or more emissions or whatever. And that's a good first step, but it misses the feedbacks at the human response part. So if your indicator is dependent on how the humans respond in the system, then you probably need to start thinking about some representation of that. So that's where those big uh, physics to fish models have now gone up into fisheries as well, where they, have, uh, they model the individual fleets moving around the, the global ocean targeting different fish stocks. That can also bring in a lot of economics, such as trade. So there's different aspects of the humans. You can, this particular model just concentrated on fish trade. Obviously, other kinds of models build up more of the human system. So an example from a model I wrote was when I was looking at the management of that beach. It was about actually following the individual decisions of people that lived. Thankfully, there was only 2,000 people that lived in this place along the whole, it's about 400 kilometres of the Western Australian coast where there's 2,000 people that live there all the time. Um, I think there's probably 2,000 people in the block that we're on, so just to give you a bit of contrast. Uh, there was also the tourists and then the different animals that lived there. We built that up for the whole of that coastline so we could understand the management and the interaction between the human decisions and what was happening in the water. So this is a circuit diagram for that particular, it's actually a simplified circuit diagram for that model. But it's actually pretty simple at heart. You've got your physical part of the world, you've got your food web, you've got how people use it, and then you've got the families that live there and how they, what they feel about the people coming to use the world, the money generated in the banking sector, and then the managers themselves. So all those same principles. So when we drew it with the people initially and we said, how do you think they world work? They had a few boxes basically where I've got a cartoon picture and it was through us digging and thinking about what indicators we had to represent. So that's why there was a thousand indicators that I had to go through because between the different management parts, so the water department and then the lands department and the fishing department, between them there was a thousand different things they said that they were looking at. So I had to try and replicate that. I think it was only probably ten things they were really looking at. 
but they said they were looking at a thousand, so I had to be able to go through that. And the way that we did that is to use the lessons that I've just given you about building it up based on the processes that are there. So we used a different way of representing both the biological part of the system but the human part of the system too. So you use different ways of crossing the scales. Okay, and you can do that within a single lifetime too. So you can have a patch of larvae, a school of juveniles and an individual adult fish. So again, depending on what information you need for indicators at different parts of the life history, you might need to, to mix and match there as well. So to go through an example of what that might look like, so this is Antarctica, so we're going to do a model of Antarctica. In particular, we're going to pick out one little bay where they're talking about potential marine protected area. So you can represent that either using the bottom shape and where the canyons are to say, OK, I'll break it up in that polygon idea. Or you can have a regular grid. I need a haircut is what I need. Um, you also have to think about time, so you'll have some seasonal calendar events like spawning events and migration that's on a calendar scale. And then you've got to think about how much of the day do I need to chop it up. So can I do just two 12-hour steps in a day or do I need six-hour steps or some plankton guys say you need like a minute step. I'm not sure I'm... For my modelling, I don't need minutes, but they might. Okay, so then we think about what the bottom looks like. So we, lay, we put in a layer that's okay, this is the sea bottom and the depths. Then we put in our sediment layers and the oceanography, the water movements come in at that point. Then the habitat comes in and this can be read through time. So we bring in ice that changes through time. Then we bring in the food web. So we have ice algae and uh, bacteria and microbes. So things that are everywhere we just do is big patches. It's the simplest way of doing it. Then as we get into the rest of the food web, you can either go through age-structured models, that's all biomass models, that's a quite common way of doing it. In this particular case, we've got different schools of fish and krill that have their own habitat preferences and their own predator-prey interactions. And then by the time we get to the top predators, again, you could follow through with that biomass and age structure way of doing it, or you can follow what's called an individual-based model. So for us, that's part of what we were looking at. So some of the behaviour of these top predators means that who they are and where they are, and if they're, the, if they're a rare species, it can be really important how many of them there are. So I don't know how many of you watched the Ice Age movies, but at one point in one of those, the last female dodo falls off the cliff. There was lots of boys left. There's just no girls left. That's kind of important when you have a rare species. And so for some of these, we actually needed to follow that because we needed to know how many girls and boys were left in the system. Then you get into the human parts of the thing. And they, in this case, also use a combination of quite aggregate models and individual models. So there's quite a lot of activity down there. There's illegal fishing, there's actual registered fishing, there's tourist liners, there's the people on the ice. Uh, one of the key parts when you're testing indicators through time is to think about what's happened in the past, what's happening now, and then what's planned or possible into the future so that you can look for the, those discontinuities. There's the connections, so there's not so many social connections down in Antarctica. There's not too many people that live there yet. But there is quite a lot of political connections and discussions. So in this case, in Australia, we would have put a lot of attention into these connections and how people share information and interact. That got transferred onto representing the political decision stage for those, this particular model. And so then we have representation of the management system. So how do these guys collect data to feed into this decision-making process? Where can the problems with their indices lead to missteps in management? So on the monitoring side of things, and I'm nearly done now, so you need to plan. The other way that you can use models is to test the indicators, right? You can also test um, sampling designs. So you need to be able to capture that. So if we a really quick go back over what uh, reference point is. So we have an indicator, OK? So this blue area represents the indicator. So you can, lots of things that we care about in the real world, we can't directly measure. So we have a proxy, like Eric was talking about yesterday. Then we say, well, at this level, that's an acceptable level for that indicator. So it might be a fish biomass. At 40% of the fish biomass, we say, OK, that's a good level of biomass for that species. At 20%, that's a bit too low. 
So then you see what your indicator, so maybe your survey index your, um, of biomass is saying about that, that index. So when it's above your reference point, that's considered a good thing. If it's below, that's bad, okay? The reason that I play with indicators in the model world is things like climate change can change where that reference level needs to be, just making that system a little bit more complex. It's also, you have to think about what kinds of data you need to generate. So it could be fisheries dependent information coming from an effort model or a catch model, but there could need to be also fisheries independent information and how you represent that. So just as you've had to think about all the processes that you need to have the animals in the ocean and the people doing the right things to generate the data, you have to think about how that data would be collected in the real world. What, you know, where would the surveys happen? Would they happen everywhere or not so much? You know, what kind of other complications come through? Are these acoustic data or biomass data? So this is where you get the errors come in. So you need to have a way of representing that error. So you'll have your actual value coming out of your model. Then you need to add the error onto it. So I don't know how many of you have ever thought about the monitoring and errors, but in the real world, you have the, the actual truth. Pretty much nobody can actually measure that directly. With, even with our best technology, we're typically a little bit off. And depending on how good that technology and your... I'm a bucket chemist. If it's anywhere close, we're good enough, you know. Pff. Other chemists are much more careful. So if this was me doing a chemical measurement, the, you know, the error bars would be quite large. A real chemist doing it might be a lot, a lot simpler. But this is your uncertainty about your observation. It's basically a combination of how easy was it to get the information, how good was the scientist, all those kind of things. On the other end, you've got if you're a model trying to estimate what's going on, you'll have the model prediction, but there'll be uncertainty around that as well. Okay, What you're ultimately aiming for is to actually have your model be pretty close to the truth and with its uncertainty overlapped by the observational uncertainty. That's kind of the holy grail of where you're ending up with model. And sometimes a model can actually be closer to the truth than the observation. So we went through using all those kind of thinking processes to look at what are good indicators for spatial management, like reserves, and how well do they do for, for reflecting what the ecosystem is doing at different scales? So this was a PhD student and colleague of mine called Penny Johnson's work. She looked at very small marine protected areas in Australia, what monitoring inside and outside those meant versus what was actually happening on the larger regional scale and the whole of ecosystem scale, given that these were being used as a way of providing ecosystem-based management. She considered both social, environmental and economic indicators. And basically, she came out with a list that was quite similar to a list that I'd found just looking at the ecosystem scale. You pretty much needed to capture the properties of the major parts of the ecosystem. The size structure was handy. You needed the biophysical context that was happening in so you could start to understand what was driving the patterns you saw in the indicators. It was harder with the human parts of the system because it was harder to detect what was driving those human parts. They've still got value, but you, have to, you can't just take them at face value and just believe them. You have to understand the human context as much as the physical context. We also found that at some scales these work. So this is an extra complication to biomass ratio or ratio indicators. So it's not just whether this part or this part has changed. It's also the level of the scale of the process. So if these are applied at very fine scales, where it's the same species each time you're looking at, they work really well. If you apply them at the ecosystem scale, where you're kind of covering all species, they work really well. At the regional scale, where you're transitioning from some species that have very local habitats to other species that are more ubiquitous, they don't work very well at all. <laughs> There's a, that's actually a scale shock that happens. So you, when you're using your indicators, you need to make sure you're using them at appropriate scales. So the other thing that Penny did was look at the sampling scheme. So these blue dots represent inside and outside the MPAs, and they're done every year, effectively. It's a low-level coverage by some very dedicated scientists. And she wanted to see what that actually meant, if you could use other ones. So one of the 
one of the options that had been presented was, okay, let's just try and do a larger coverage, but we'll do it as big snapshots. So either once every so often we just go look at that larger scale and we save up money in between by not doing these, we just do a survey every five years altogether. Or the other option was to keep doing these, but every five years just go out and try and get a much more complete picture of everything. It seemed to be a pragmatic compromise versus um, the other option as a test, sort of as a reference point, was just to pretend you had money as no option, we could just go wherever we liked. So what we found was that, at least according to the model test, that the indicators that they were using and the sampling design they had was biased, but it was kind of biased in the same way the whole time. So the information they were getting out of it was consistent for making a management decision because there wasn't extra complications that could trip them up. When you got to just infrequent snapshots, so you'd saved all your money through here and then spent it on one big survey, it'd take you about 60 years to tell anything had happened, unless you had a really good statistician who gave you a really good sampling stratified design that could also cope with climate change and changing animal distribution. You really took a long time to notice anything. If you had really high frequency money is no object, you also suffered a little bit from sampling design, but you could actually get that signal much faster because statistics could cope with the fact it was similar variance the whole way through. The problem came when you tried to do the compromise. If you came at it as a pretty uninformed statistician, though it actually tripped up a few of the better statisticians as well, it was the mix that was happening that was the problem. You actually had to disconnect the two data streams from here and the more continuous one to see if you could get information by comparing the indicators and building together rather than mixing them up. So you just had to be more careful about your statistics in that case. And that's something that we need to think about in the real world when we are trying to build pragmatic monitoring schemes. The other thing that cropped up that we noticed was People said they cared about diversity and it also suggested that in our system lobsters were a good correlation with that diversity. So lobster biomass was a good proxy for overall diversity. What we found in the model was that was true in one spot, it was the complete opposite in a different spot in the model domain, so in a different space. So within the model space this was about 300 kilometres from here, in fact in some places it was only 100 kilometres away. And we thought, if we screwed up the model, what have we done wrong? We went back to the real world biologists and they go, oh, no, no, that matches what we see. So one of the tricky parts about trying to have an ecological indicator was that reference line. For a whole ecosystem, what's that reference line? So what had happened in the literature were people saying a reference direction. If things going up or things going down, that's your, what's your reference point, a trend rather than a single spot. The problem was that we're starting to see that these things happen. So you can't just take necessarily the same rule that's worked somewhere else and immediately apply it to your area. You do need that ecosystem specific understanding um, to carry you through. The useful way that Penny could do this though was that because she was effectively God to this, this model, she could see right into what was truth. She could see what the model was really saying about an attribute about how that works versus the indicator. What you're after is a linear connection because it's really clear that if you've got a low value, you're in one management or ecosystem state, and if you've got a high value, you're in a different state. If you've got a humped relationship and you're down here, is it good or is it bad? You don't know. So you're trying to find indicators with a linear connection. She also looked at how well they performed at different scales. Again, because she was God, she could see that kind of stuff. The extra process that you can take in a thing called marine... Uh, management strategy evaluation is you can put in the whole assessment process. So you can generate that data, you can look at the indicators and then you can go through the assessment process and if you're a manager inside that model look at the feedback that can happen. So that you can start to see how robust the system is to the way you're using the indicators. Okay, so this is it now, I'll stop boring you all to death, but basically you've got to think about, even if you don't explicitly include in your model all of those details about how the system works, you have to have thought about it because every time you decide to put something in the model, you've explicitly decided to not put in everything else. Okay? So you need to have really thought through those processes. You need to keep in mind that there's always going to be something that you've forgotten that will be important somewhere. 
You need to allow for this model to have different states it can get to. So hard wiring and answers not very useful. You need to have the feedback so you can get different outcomes. But most of all, when you're testing an indicator, you have to make sure that the data it generates is realistic enough that it's actually going to be a good test for the indicator. Uh, so there are some rules of best practice. The most part of it is just play. Imagine that you're using mathematical Lego or whatever you want to call it. You're just playing with the world in a version of the world. Don't ever get scared. Most people say, I'm not a modeler. But you are, actually. Anything that's alive is a modeler. So even bacteria, because they don't go towards heat unless they're extremophile and they want heat. So they have a little mental model or two that says heat good or bad, OK? So everybody is a modeler. The other part of it is in building an indicator, and so the models that need to test it, you do need some anchors so that you've got something to compare to. Something that can just vary all the time isn't very useful. So you need a process of having an anchor for your indicator or your, s your sampling design, but you need to allow it the flexibility to deal with the changes it's going to be confronted with in changing ecosystems. The key part, and a place that many scientists fall over, is they assume if I've got really fine detail over here, that more really fine detail everywhere is going to fix the problem. It doesn't. It never does. It's a trade-off. Think of it like an elastic band. If I want to put way more effort in pulling it over here, I've got to let it give a little bit over here or it's just going to snap and not work at all. And the last one is use lots of different models. There's no one right model. It's all about thinking about the world in different ways. So I'd rather you went for an eclectic set of different kinds of models then spent your whole life trying to build the one epic model to answer everything. And that's it. So there's not too many people asleep for the next person. So have you got any questions, anyone? You, and you, uh, you need to decide what type of model uh, you need to use depends on the problem you're dealing with. So my question is that, uh, is it possible to have a standard uh, in, the diff uh, in the community uh, to help people know that uh, how, um, how complexity the model need? Uh, I'm sorry, yeah, <laughs> it's yeah, hard yeah, to find. Yep. So is it possible to set up a standard in different uh, community to uh, have people know that uh, uh, how complexity the model is needed to be? Um, so that's where so the model is. Yeah, yeah, so I mean, uh, yeah, in other words, is that, uh, uh, how do we decide, uh, is there possible to um, quantify um, how, uh, do we, uh, how do we need to decide if the, uh, how, do we, how do we decide if the model is good enough for, for the problem we target at. Okay, so one of the key parts is structural uncertainty. So how you've tied the parts together. So there's no existing, this is probably where the modelers have got too caught up in there playing with models and forgotten to write it all up. Well, I would be victim of that. Um, we don't have a, like a recipe book that you can go to and say you definitely need these bits in this case. The test that I do is that I build I build it a bit of a time, basically. So I think this is what the minimum that I need to represent the world. If I put in one extra bit, does it get a bit better or has it actually got worse? So at the present moment, for me, it's a little bit of... We call it suck it and see in Australia. Did it work? Did it not work? So there's no formal mathematical way. I mean, you could maybe use cluster analysis and stuff. There's a process called... Um, well, the regular coloration and the qualitative modelling between those, you can get an idea of useful structures, and it's very simple and very fast mathematics you can do in a single afternoon. That can give you an idea of where to start as the anchor point, but then it's still, it's very much almost like an art, it's, which isn't very satisfying to say to the science world, I know, but there is no recipe book. So the best thing to do is try and find someone who's an experienced modeler that you can bounce ideas off. So you can say, what would you do in this situation? Do you think I've got close enough, but just play, try different options and see if you get a better answer. Keith's actually been modelling a long time, much longer than me, so ask him. Thank you. <laughs>
Uh, so uh, Uh, one is the uh, is the science side. In other words, how would a scientist go about uh, you know, deciding or defending what is an adequate model for a given circumstance? And I think that's really what Beth was was answering. But the other broader issue is how does how could we as scientists convince uh, the general population or a politician that actually this is uh, uh, this is okay? This is actually. Uh, uh, sufficient for the for the purpose. So that's a slightly different question, and uh, there's no there's no answer to that one either. But what I would like to suggest is that you know for the group here, that is a topic really worth putting some thought into. I mean, other, other disciplines like engineers, for example, have got standards for what is acceptable for certain tasks. Uh, I think part of the problem that we've got is that we don't have anything like that. Now, we maybe don't want it for the science side, but I think we do need it for the uh, external communication side. Um, okay, uh, well, I can speak very loud. Um, even though you say I'm a modeler, I don't normally consider myself one, but uh, uh, to me, uh, you, when you start with a site to build your model, I'm thinking normally as a, as a scientist, I, I think of what first I would think about what is the problem and what do I need to know. And um, uh, what you've shown us is, uh, isn't it basic, uh, mostly empirical models? So, to representations of the world? Yeah, yeah, it's, um, except from the conceptual model showed, uh, there are theoretical models, and uh, one might start also with that most, mostly, probably more narrower scale, probably. <laughs> 